Welcome to the MegaCast. I'm Tyler Keeft in the studios of our flagship stations, Civic Center TV and 89.3 Lakes FM. In addition, today, as always, also joining us on Comcast Channel 15 and AT&T Channel 99 is Birmingham Area Municipal Access, serving Birmingham, Bloomfield Hills, and Bloomfield Township. Also, City Cable 15 of Southfield. Uh, which, of course, is covering Southfield. You can join us also on Channel 10, both in Orion Township and in Lake Orion on Orion Neighborhood Television and in Waterford on the media network of Waterford. Join us on the radio also in Birmingham, Bloomfield Hills, Bloomfield Township, and Troy on 88.1, the BIF, a service of the Bloomfield Hills School District. And then you can find us online in many different places. Let's start with our website, civiccentertv.com. Just click on our Watch Live link, or if you're on the computer web browser and you're on our homepage, while you're exploring our homepage, you can go ahead and just click play on our player or unmute the player at the top right of our homepage and watch us live from our homepage at civiccentertv.com. Also there on our, on our homepage, we also have links to our Facebook page, facebook.com slash civiccentertv, where we're broadcasting live 10 a.m. to 12 noon on the Megacast Monday through Friday, as well as on our other Facebook page at Lakes FM, Civic Center TV 15 and Lakes FM, our Facebook pages. Also join us on My Michigan TV, otherwise known as as my my going to, uh, by going to mymytv.com where you can find more information about where you can download the my my tv app for free on your smartphone and on your smart tv find more of their original programming such as uh, Lato Live, which broadcasts after us from 12 noon until 1 p.m. Uh, Monday through Friday most of the time, and other programs that they import and they create themselves all around the state of Michigan at MyMyTV.com. And if you need more information about any of our partnering stations, you want to figure out where we're broadcasting most local to you every day, Monday through Friday, 10 to noon, and also for replays and live to tape and other places, go to our website at CivicCenterTV.com and click on our Megacast link. There we have links to each and every one of our partnering television, radio, and other media outlets, uh, as well as, uh, as access to watch our full episodes and each individual interview dating all the way back to our first episodes in March of 2020, they're on our website again, civiccentertv.com slash megacast. Then right next to that, civiccentertv.com's coronavirus page has up-to-date helpful information that links directly to trusted resources and experts at the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention, the Michigan Department of Health and Human Services, and the Oakland County Health Division so that you can stay up-to-date on all the information about COVID-19, uh, how it's affecting our community, how it is spreading in our community, learn more about uh, new variants that may pop up, such as the Omicron variant. Uh, which is now in the United States after uh, a case was identified earlier this week in California. I'll learn more information on that as well as precautionary measures and of course all the information you need to know about vaccinations including where you can get vaccinated here in Oakland County and through the state of Michigan and CDC resources where you can get vaccinated all across the state of Michigan and around the U.S. Also on our coronavirus page we post our top stories each and every day from across the state of Michigan and of course today uh, here in Oakland County uh, continuing to be the top story is the aftermath of the school shooting on Tuesday at Oxford High School. Yesterday, Oakland County Prosecutor Karen McDonald in a press conference uh, announced charges against the 15-year-old suspect uh, who is now going to be facing both terrorism and first-degree murder charges. This is from the Detroit Free Press. Oakland County Prosecutor Karen McDonald is seeking numerous charges against 15-year-old Ethan Crumbly, the suspect in Tuesday's rampage at Oxford High School that has uh, uh, left four students dead. If convicted, Crumbly could spend the rest of his life behind behind bars without the possibility of parole. Charges include four counts of first-degree murder, terrorism, and firearm possession charges uh, as well, McDonald announced on Wednesday afternoon. Karen McDonald is seeking to charge Crumbly as an adult and may pursue charges as well against his parents, James and Jennifer Crumbly, also, uh, as she mentioned yesterday uh, at her press conference in the afternoon. That full press conference also, by the way, uh, was live-streamed on our Facebook page, uh, courtesy of video from Local for Detroit's live stream on our Web, on our Facebook page, Civic Center TV 15 on Facebook, if you'd like to watch that entire press conference uh, on demand. Uh, Crumbly, a sophomore at Oxford, is accused of killing four people, uh, Hannah St. Juliana, 14, Tate Meyer, 16, Madison Baldwin, 17, and Justin Schilling, a 17-year-old, and injuring seven others in the attack on Tuesday. Uh, these are the following charges that McDonald's office is seeking against Crumbly. One count of terrorism causing death, four counts of first degree murder, seven counts of assault with intent to murder, and 12 counts of possession of a firearm in the commission 
commission of a felony. Uh, Crumbly was arranged, oh, sorry, was arraigned at district court in Rochester Hills on Wednesday afternoon. Uh, he joined via video from Oakland County's Children's Village, a juvenile center. Uh, the investigation thus far has pointed investigators to believe Crumbly's actions were not impulsive, contributing to McDonald's desire to charge the teen as an adult, she said. Uh, furthermore, under Michigan law, some crimes are so severe that they require the suspect to be automatically treated as an adult, foremost first-degree murder, which Im implies premeditation. Uh, quote, charges that charging this person as an adult is necessary to achieve justice and protect the public, and closed quote, Karen McDonald said on Wednesday, hours before the suspect was arraigned. Quote, I'm committed to seeking justice for the victims of the Oxford High School shooting and all Oakland County kids who face violence, and closed quote. The terrorism charge, uh, Prosecutor McDonald said, is in relation to the horrors inflicted upon the rest of the school's community who weren't direct victims but still faced trauma from the events. Quote, what's, uh, what's about all the children who ran screaming, hiding under desks? What about all the children at home who can't eat and can't sleep and can't imagine a world where they could ever step foot back in that school? And closed quote uh, from Karen McDonald. That full article uh, from the Detroit Free Press posted on our website, civiccentertv.com slash coronavirus. And related to Tuesday's events, uh, in the wake of those events, multiple copycat incidents and threats, uh, that uh, multiple copycat threats have been made to other schools here in Oakland County, resulting in, in several school closings. This from the Oakland Press. Uh, Thousands of students are staying home today as districts have closed out of a quote-unquote abundance of caution following a wave of threats shared on social media. The threats followed Tuesday's af Tuesday afternoon shooting at Oxford High School where four students were killed and seven other people have been injured. Closed schools today include Rochester, Southfield, Lake Orion, Troy, Bloomfield Hills, Auburn Hills, Clarkston, Huron Valley, Warren, Holly, and West Bloomfield School Districts, among others. Uh, Oxford Community Schools had already announced its buildings would be closed for the remainder of this week. Quote, Nothing is more important than the well-being of our school community, and we are committed to doing all that we can to keep students and staff safe, and closed quote, uh, said the Rochester Community School District uh, in an announcement on their Facebook page about today's closings. Quote, uh, there have been rumors circulating on social media indicating that other high schools may be at risk of experiencing a tragedy similar to the one that occurred recently at Oxford High School. At Rochester Community Schools, we take all threats very seriously. All rumors continue to be thoroughly investigated by our local law enforcement. Although there appear to be no credible threats at this time, we are, pa we are pausing in-person and virtual learning for the day out of an abundance of caution. We appreciate families encouraging their students to continue talking with a trusted adult if they see or hear something that doesn't seem right. Families can contact a school administrator or use the Talk to Us feature on the RCS website. Information can also be reported anonymously using OK to Say at 855-565-2729. And again, OK, OK to Say is available uh, to schools, uh, to people in, involved in our schools all throughout Oakland County. So that's not just limited to the Rochester Community Schools. That's all schools in Oakland County. Uh, okay to say his number again, the anonymous line, 855 565 27. Nine. Oakland County Sheriff Michael Bouchard said such threats will be thoroughly investigated and charges will be levi levied even if the threats are not credible. Quote, if you make a threat, we are going to seek charges. That's how it broadens this whole anxiety and depression that many parents and students are feeling, and it's incredibly disturbing, in close quote. In Southfield, the, the district attributed its closure to threats along with a, quote, significant number of student absences, in close quote. In the city, police say uh, a student brought a gun to school on, uh, sorry, a bun brought a gun into a school building. Holly Area School and Clarkston Community Schools are also closed on Thursday and will be closed Friday as well here in West Bloomfield, uh, where we originate our broadcast. Schools are closed both today, Thursday, and tomorrow, Friday, December 3rd, as well as all after-school activities being canceled. Uh, continuing in this article, quote, the Holly Police Department and Holly Schools Administration uh, have been recent receiving and jointly investigating numerous reports of threats on various social media platforms that, quote, someone is going to shoot up Holly Schools. Uh, Holly Police said on Facebook, they continued, we have recent... We have received dozens of screenshots of Holly students sharing various screenshots of a report that, quote, someone heard someone say, uh, 
and dot, dot, dot. We have spoken to numerous students who have shared these posts. However, no one can identify the original source of the threat. Uh, parents, please assist us by advising students to stop posting and sharing these messages. We are asking any parent or student who has information that would identify the person or persons who are making or verbalizing threats to contact the Holly Police Department by calling 248-858-4911. Again, Holly Police Department's number 248 248- 8584911 quote making making threats to shoot up a school is a crime sharing and posting unknown threats is extremely traumatizing to a community already traumatized by a very real strategy in close quote uh, in close by Clarkston, the district reported, quote, dozens of indirect threats reported to the Oakland County Sheriff's Office throughout the county this evening, and close quote. Uh, continuing on, quote, at this time, none of the threats investigated have been deemed credible. However, the volume of indirect threats in the county makes it impossible for law enforcement to investigate each threat thoroughly, Clarkston Schools said. Continuing, the safety of our students and staff is our top priority, and at this time, we cannot take the risk. We will continue to work with the Oakland County Sheriff's Office office and keep you informed and close quote in Bloomfield Hills and Bloomfield Township students are home on Thursday as well quote the safety and security of our students is our top priority uh, we are in constant contact with the West Bloom with the Bloomfield Township Police Department who take every report or rumor seriously said Pat Watson superintendent of the Bloomfield Hills School District continuing we will follow up with you tomorrow with any updated information. Please take care of yourselves and one another. That full article from the Oakland Press with adi additional links that will provide you with more information and more context. Uh, Post it on our website, civiccentertv.com slash coronavirus. Lastly, making news today on the coronavirus front, Michigan adds 16,530 new cases and 358 deaths from COVID-19 on Wednesday, including cases from the previous day on Tuesday. That's from the Detroit News. The addition brings the state's total uh, to 1,318,123 confirmed cases and just over 24,000 deaths from the virus since March of 2020. Michigan hit a new record of adult hospitalizations from the virus on Monday and 80% of all hospital inpatient beds are full. Michigan broke the weekly record of new cases November 13 through 19, setting a seven-day total of 53,575 cases, a new high not seen throughout the entirety of the coronavirus pandemic. Uh, Michigan's Department of Health and Human Services issued an advisory earlier in November, just before the holidays, recommending people wear masks at indoor gatherings regardless of their vaccination status. It will remain in, a, in effect until further notice. Again, that is an advisory. It is um, basically, uh, legally speaking, a suggestion from the MDHHS. It, does not, it is not a mandate. It is not uh, protected uh, by law or enforceable by law. It is rather just a suggestion from the MDHHS about be best practices to prevent the spread of COVID-19. Michigan remains at high transmission rate and the state's percentage of tests returning positive has increased from last week. Michigan reported the second most cases in the country over the last seven days. Last week, 18.9% of Michigan's COVID-19 tests were positive, jumping by 1.5% from 17.4% the previous week. Again, um, community spread is evident in test positivity by being at or above 3%. Here we are, uh, almost 16% at this point, above that metric here in Michigan. So significant spread of COVID-19 still abundant here in Michigan. Nine hospital systems are 100% full according to the latest state data. They include Beaumont in Wayne County, ProMedica CV Hickman in Adrian, uh, Spectrum Health Hospitals in Grand Rapids, Hastings, Reed City, Fremont, uh, St. Joseph Mercy in Ann Arbor, Livingston, and Sturgis Hospital, and another 20 hospitals are above 90% full at this time as well. About 71% of residents 16 and older have at least their first dose of the vaccine, while uh, those 5 and older are at 61% of their first dose uh, in the state as of now. Case rates among children are higher in counties where school districts do not have mask policies, according to state health department information as well. In Michigan, over 50% of children hospitalized for the virus have reported no underlying conditions. Outbreaks have led to an increase in multi-system inflammatory syndrome in children, or MISC, which is a condition where multiple organ systems be become inflamed or dysfunctional altogether. There are 183 cases in the state, and the majority, or 71%, of those afflicted with MISC are in the ICU. There have been five deaths total so far uh, from MISC 
uh, during the pandemic. Uh, that, that's all of our top stories today. They're posted on our website, civiccentertv.com slash coronavirus, as well as important information and resources from local municipalities, as well as the Oakland County Health Division at the state level from the MDHHS and federally from the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention. Uh, we have a great show ahead of you today. Coming up next, we'll speak with Rich Pullman, the Warning Coordination Meteorologist at the National Weather Service for Detroit and Pontiac. That's coming up at 1020. At 1040, J.J. Conway, the principal attorney and founder of the J of J.J. Con uh, Conway Law, will join us on the program. We'll kick off the 11 o'clock hour with financial advisor Rick Bloom from Bloom Advisors. At 1120, uh, we'll be joined by Filthy Rockwell of Filthy Cares. And then we will cap off the show today at 1140 a.m. with uh, Oakland University professor of political sci science uh, and the director of their Center for Civic Engagement, Dave Dulio, will be back with us once again. That's all coming up next. You're watching and listening to the Megacast. We may come from different organizations, but we work together to protect the Huron River for everyone. Most of the pollution that goes into our rivers is carried by rainwater that flows off of roads, parking lots, and rooftops. The leaves and bark of a single tree can retain a surprising amount of rainwater. Depending on its size and species, it could be 100 gallons or more. It is estimated that an urban forest can reduce annual runoff by up to 7%. Here's one thing that we know can help keep our water clean. Plant a tree. Plant a tree. Plant a tree. There's one water and it's ours to protect. you can look for in your friends is a change in behavior. These can be big changes, they can be small changes in mood, physical appearance, they may be sleeping less or sleeping more, drinking more, or their eating patterns may be different. One big change that can be pretty obvious is change in motivation. Do they no longer want to play basketball? Do they no longer want to play video games? Now that we're spending more time online and in virtual settings, it's really important to pay attention to the language that your friend is using and the words they're using to communicate. So when we text our friends, are they taking longer amounts of time to respond? Are they not responding at all? You don't have to be an expert to try to recognize these signs. The second that you feel it in your gut and that you're concerned, that's a second to have the conversation and open the door to what might be going on. Whatever, whatever, whatever Today, it is easier than ever to join Michigan's Organ Donor Registry and help build a bridge of hope for organ, tissue, and eye donation. Just one person can potentially save or help improve the lives of up to 75 people. By joining, your legacy could be the gift of life. Sign up today at michigan.gov SOS or at any of the more than 145 Secretary of State self-service stations located across Michigan. Be part of Michigan's Bridge of Hope by adding your name to the organ donor registry. When times get dark, we can't see the help that's all around us. When you don't know where to turn, let 211 be your guiding light. Two one one, how can I help you? Our guides are ready to connect you with the help you need. For help with food, health care, mental health, and other resources. Call 211 or visit 211.org. 211. Get connected. Get help. Welcome back to the Megacast. I'm Tyler Keefe here in our studios in West Greenfield Township. Although we're broadcasting throughout Oakland County and across the state of Michigan on a number of different outlets, you can learn more information and find all of our shows and interviews on demand at civiccentertv.com slash megacast. Well, according to the National Oceanic and Administration, Sorry. The National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration, easier for you to say, uh, the Great Lakes are unusually warm right now, and that could have some implications for the winter season and beyond. Uh, and uh, 
here to tell us a little bit about, about how, what implications that may have and, and how organizations such as the National Weather Service predict uh, the f our future weather patterns based on information such as that is Rich Pullman. He is a warning coordination meteorologist at the National Weather Service for Detroit and Pontiac. Rich, thank you for being with us today. Uh, good morning. I'm glad to be here. Glad to have you on. So uh, first off, you're a warning coordination meteorologist. Uh, for those that may not know what that is, uh, decode that for us. What does it mean to be a warning coordination meteorologist? Yeah, it sounds like a pretty impressive title. Yes. And basically, I, I get to meet with a lot of our partner groups, whether it's uh, the television uh, meteorologist, uh, government partners, especially in Homeland Security and emergency management, uh, and then also with boaters, pilots, um, schools, and all of our spotters out there that help us during severe weather. I meet with these groups, uh, talk about our operations at the Weather Service, and then get their feedback to help improve how we issue our watches, warnings, and day-to-day -day forecasts. And so, uh, and so uh, a report, as I said, came in that the Great Lakes are unusually warm right now, and that could have some uh, implications for our winter weather, or it could be a, an indicator for what's to come this winter or even beyond that. Uh, just how unusually warm are the Great Lakes at this time, and what sort of effects could that have on our weather going forward? Sure. Um, at the end of October, we were at or very close to record warmth for that time of year. Uh, as you may have noticed, in November we had quite a bit of cool weather, um, and so our, our lake water temperature is not at record levels anymore, but we're still in the top one or two uh, highest recorded uh, Great Lakes temperatures uh, since the water temperature started being uh, tracked. Uh, so what that gives us is a lot of uh, heat and a lot of potential energy for and, and moisture for any snows that uh, develop from our lake effect snow process. So as we get the cold air from the winter blowing across the Great Lakes, it allows for more heat and moisture to escape into the atmosphere that lead to those lake effect snow showers. So the greatest impacts are certainly gonna be felt from these warmer lakes. Uh, if we get cold air and it'll be closer to the lake, the more likely you'll see those impacts. Here in Southeast Michigan, in an average year, we might see a a uh, couple of inches, uh, maybe up to five to eight extra inches of snow because the lakes versus areas that don't have the lakes, like in Wisconsin or farther south in Ohio and Indiana. Given our climate, we might see an extra three to eight inches of snow. This year, if we do manifest the colder air moving over the lakes because there's so much more heat and moisture available, well, we might boost that up a little bit more here in Metro Detroit. So then, Rich, uh, in terms of sustainability of, of these changes, um, because the Great Lakes have been so much warmer than usual, because, as you just mentioned, all those different uh, uh, effects that come from that uh, increased warmth, uh, could that sustain itself throughout the winter? Or at some point, it, would you expect, or could we expect, that the Great Lakes uh, temperature could uh, adjust to more normal to a more normal situation, and then that could change the weather patterns in winter. Or should this be something that we could expect to be pretty consistent uh, as we head into the winter and go through the winter season? Yeah, it's all going to depend on how cold the cold air masses are coming down from Canada or maybe Alaska or the Arctic. Uh, the more cold air we get, uh, the more of that Arctic outbreak uh, cold air that we get, the more likely the lake temperatures will cool off get closer to normal, and then we might see some ice develop on the lakes. I mean, we always see ice develop on the lakes, but with more heat, it's gonna take a lot more cold air to, to um, cool those lakes uh, to get the ice to form. So if we get a lot of cold air, uh, get the average amount of ice, then we'll get more into the average lake effect snow pattern, which generally tends to drop off once we get into February in March, just because there's less open water, uh, there's not as much heat and moisture that can escape into the atmosphere to generate that. Um, there's all, all sorts of little um, idiosyncrasies with how the atmosphere works. We can still have a lot of cold air move over the lakes, 
Uh, but if it's a very dry air mass, we won't see as much lake effect because the dry air will help uh, evaporate the moisture that comes off of the lake. Um, and, and some of the other things that can happen with the warmer lake waters is that the first batches of cold air that move across the Great Lakes are going to be modified quite a bit. The warm lake water will actually warm up the cold air. So places like Wisconsin are always much colder than Michigan because of that warm air uh, surrounding the Great Lakes. It modifies our air temperatures and, and reduces the impacts of the Arctic air masses and cold Canadian air masses that come down across the Great Lakes. We're joined by Rich Pullman. He is the Warning Coordination Meteorologist with the National Weather Service serving Detroit and Pontiac, joining us on the Megacast. So we know the Great Lakes are warmer. We, we uh, have discussed how, some of the ways that uh, that greater warmth could affect our weather patterns uh, in the remainder of this fall season and heading into the winter and throughout the winter season. Uh, but what are some of the causes, to your knowledge, to, to the National Weather Service, to NOAA's uh, knowledge, what are some of the reasons behind why the Great Lakes are so much warmer than usual right now? Well, we had a, a warm summer. Uh, it was in the top 10 warmest summers uh, on record. Um, and that followed actually a very warm uh, winter. Uh, so w the lakes didn't start off uh, the uh, springtime in 2021 uh, as cold as they normally would have. And so then when you uh, add a top 10 warmest summer on top of uh, a warm lake already, uh, it warmed up to near record levels or at record levels for the fall when we usually get our, our warmest water temperatures right at the end of the summer and the beginning of the fall. Uh, and, and we may not have noticed as many 90 degree days, but really where we see the warmth happening is at night. We don't cool off at night, especially in the summer, as cool as we used to. So there is some aspects that are tied back to climate change. This one particular year of 2021 is a little harder to tie back to climate change, but this overall pattern that we've seen in the Great Lakes of warmer temperatures um, and can have, and there are some fingerprints of uh, global warming and climate change that uh, that you can see from that. Rich Pullman joins us on the Megacast, a warning coordination meteorologist with the National Weather Service serving Detroit and Pontiac. Um, so you mentioned climate change. Does the continuously changing climate and the, and the gradual changes that come with the overall climate change we're experiencing worldwide, is that making it more difficult for you and, and for your other colleagues as meteorologists to uh, predict upcoming weather patterns and where we might be going throughout the rest of this year and into the years ahead? On a day-to-day -day basis, uh, and we forecast out for seven days uh, at, at our local office, we have a climate prediction center that will do forecast out for two weeks, four weeks, and then monthly. Um, the day-to-day um, -day forecast, um, you won't see the effects of that climate change, and so the forecast uh, isn't any more difficult than it ever than it always is on a day-by-day -day forecast. And, and there are always challenges to make that forecast out for seven days. Uh, but um, as we look at sort of the longer-range forecast, when our climate prediction center is forecasting for the next year on a month by month basis. Uh, they are um, using some of that global warming uh, influences and in how, how those climate models that forecast out to a year or, or longer are, are used and implemented in making those forecasts. Uh, and so you see those trends across the nation when the Climate Prediction Center issues a winter outlook uh, like they did uh, just a few weeks ago uh, in mid-November when they issued the official winter outlook. We're joined by Rich Pullman, a warning coordination meteorologist with the National Weather Service serving Detroit and Pontiac, joining us today on the Megacast. And so uh, we, all, we often hear about uh, El Nino versus El, El, uh, La Nina and, and how those uh, occurrences out in the Pacific uh, can affect weather, particularly on the western side of the country, but uh, La Nina and El Nino also affect weather here in the Midwest and in the state of Michigan specifically as well. Uh, give us an overview of, of the differences between El Nino and La Nina and the ways that uh, both of those occurrences can affect weather patterns here in Michigan. 
Uh, sure, uh, happy to. Um, El Nino is when we have warmer than average temperatures off of the coast of South America in the Pacific Ocean, the Eastern Pacific Ocean. The opposite of that is La Nina, which is cooler than water, average water temperatures in the Eastern Pacific. There's also a condition where we have the average and we have those winters uh, as well. Right now we are in a La Nina winter. Uh, this is our second year in a row, which is pretty typical to have two La Nina winters in a row. Uh, and like you said, it affects the West Coast and the South much more than the Great Lakes. Uh, and the northeast part of the United States, just because we're farther from the Pacific Ocean. And there are other circulations in the atmosphere around the Arctic, around the North Atlantic, that have greater influence on the Great Lakes and Northeast United States. Unfortunately, the Arctic oscillations and North Atlantic oscillations can only be forecast about two to four weeks in advance. So it's a little harder to use that to forecast for the winter or forecast for the entire summer. Whereas California, they can look at what El Nino and La Nina look like, and they know pretty much what to expect for their cold season, their winter season. So for most La Nina winters, uh, what happens is the jet stream gets pushed up into uh, Alaska and uh, Western Canada, and then it usually dives down across the Central Plains and then back up into the Northeast and the Great Lakes. That puts us in the, the storm track, uh, and what side of that storm track will determine how cold or how warm we are, but we are gonna be in the storm track so we can expect on average more storms, more precipitation. Some of that will be rain, some of that will be snow. And we'll just have to see uh, which side of those storms we, are, we end up at more often to see if we'll have above or below normal snowfall. We're joined by Rich Pullman. He is a warning coordination meteorologist with the National Weather Service of Detroit and Pontiac joining us today on the Megacast. And so uh, as we continue to see the effects of climate change gradually impacting uh, our weather patterns across the seasons here in Michigan over time, um, knowing that climate change will continue to have an effect on the state, on the state of Michigan and, and on our overall climate here in the U.S. And, and climate all around the world, does that make it tougher for uh, or, or how does that change the way that you and other meteorologists at uh, NWS and at NOAA and other organizations approach uh, trying to predict or anticipate weather patterns over the next five years, 10 years, 20 years and beyond? Yeah, one of the uh, signals with climate change here in the Great Lakes, northern half of the United States and Canada is just more precipitation. And, uh, and the heavy rain days end up being even more pronounced, even more rainfall. And so we kind of saw uh, that this summer, and as a matter of fact, we've seen this uh, uh, through the course of the last 30 to 40 years, that when we get heavy rain events, uh, there's more rain with them. And our infrastructure was designed uh, 50, 100 years ago uh, for a different climate. And so, uh, that precipitation signal in our global warming, our climate change that we're experiencing is probably the most significant for the state of Michigan and especially for urban areas. Uh, and it's something that, uh, you know, we expect to issue more flash flood warnings uh, because of the, the chances of having heavier rain events when those heavy thunderstorm uh, rain events happen. We're joined by Rich Pullman. He is a warning coordination meteorologist with the National Weather Service of Detroit and Pontiac. Uh, Rich, just another couple minutes with you before we'll say goodbye today. Uh, anything else that, uh, on the weather front that we should be uh, keeping aware of as we head into the winter season or anything else that we haven't discussed today uh, that you would like to talk about? Well, with winter weather in Michigan, um, you know, we certainly want to pay attention to the big snowstorms. You'll hear a lot about them. Uh, it, there's a lot of talk on television, on radio, between your neighbors when those happen. Uh, but in Michigan, uh, we started talking, out of, uh, talking about lake effect. And so when those lake effect snow showers move across the state of Michigan, uh, they can uh, drop the visibility very quickly. Uh, they can turn a dry uh, interstate highway into one that's snow covered and icy. And this is what leads to a lot of multi-car pileups uh, here in, in the state of Michigan. When you go from that dry pavement 
clear visibility to all of a sudden that wall of white snow covered roads and you go from 70 to 80 mile an hour traffic down to uh, uh, road conditions that don't allow you to go over 30 or 40 miles an hour. And so we issue a snow squall warning for those type of events. The snow squall warning will be alerted on your cell phones, just like a tornado warning or some of our most significant flash flood warnings uh, through the wireless emergency alert system. And uh, that alerts you to when you're going into that wall of white where the roads are gonna go from dry, uh, high speed type of conditions into those icy conditions. And we're trying to avoid those multi-car pileups. And unfortunately, uh, every year uh, we see those multi-car pileups across the country, uh, are, they end up with fatalities and injuries. And so that's what we're trying to prevent. And so we have a lot of those snow squall issues with these lake effect snows that break off from Lake Michigan and travel all the way here to Metro Detroit. Well, Rich, we thank you very much for your insight, giving us some more information and uh, yeah, clearing up some of the confusion that may be there with um, what may be coming in this winter and, and some, some things to expect uh, in terms of the effects of climate change on Michigan's weather and climate in the years to come. Thank you very much. Thank you. Appreciate it. We're going to take a quick break. On the other side, we will transition from the weather to COVID-19 and how it's affecting uh, insurance and particularly insurance law. J.J. Conway, the principal attorney and the founder of J.J. Conway Law, will join us next to talk about that. You're watching and listening to the Megacast. If you are struggling to afford your internet bills during the pandemic, there's a temporary government program that may be able to help. It's called the Emergency Broadband Benefit, and it provides up to a $50 monthly discount on your broadband bill to qualifying households. Find more information about the program, including if you qualify and how to enroll at FCC.gov slash broadband benefit or call toll free at 833-511-0311. A public service announcement from 89.3. Lakes FM. Whether you're the city, the county, or the Huron River Watershed Council, we work together to protect water resources for everyone. Most of the pollution entering our rivers is carried by rainwater that runs off roads, parking lots, and rooftops. A rain garden helps catch stormwater runoff. Rain gardens and their plants help dirty runoff soak into the ground. You can do your part to help keep our water clean. Learn about rain gardens and native plants. So consider a rain garden in your home landscaping. Catch the runoff with a rain garden. There's one water and it's ours to protect. I couldn't breathe at all. There was lots of talk about putting me on a ventilator. I thought I was gonna die. I was 39 weeks pregnant and had a scheduled C-section. During that time I got COVID and was hospitalized for a month. I had a blood clot in my lungs. It caused me to go into right-sided heart failure. I was really scared. I kept texting my husband and my mom, telling them how scared I was, and I was worried that he was gonna grow up without a mom. And then I was worried if, when I did get home, that he wouldn't know who I was. You know, being 27 and a mom and a wife, and having that all almost taken away from me. It's scary, and if a vaccine can prevent that from happening, why not? Get your vaccine. I don't want this to happen to anybody else. A message from the staff of Michigan's Crime Victim Compensation Program. Anyone can be a victim of crime. And suffer lasting trauma, physically, emotionally, and financially. But you are not alone. If you're struggling financially due to a crime, we're here for you. Find out if you qualify for crime victim compensation. Call 877-251-7373 or visit michigan.gov slash crime victim. A message from the Michigan Department of Health and Human Services, Division of Victim Services. If you are struggling to afford your internet bills during the pandemic, there's a temporary government program that may be able to help. It's called the Emergency Broadband Benefit, and it provides up to a $50 monthly discount on your broadband bill to qualifying households. Find more information about the program, including if you qualify and how to enroll at FCC.gov slash broadband benefit or call toll free at 833-511-0311. A public service announcement from 89.3. Lakes FM. 
Welcome back to the Megacast. I'm Tyler Keith here in our studios in West Bloomfield Township, but broadcasting all throughout the state of Michigan. Learn more information, find all of our episodes and our interviews on demand on civiccentertv.com slash megacast. Well, uh, during the COVID-19 pandemic, uh, many COVID-related medical procedures or needs were were uh, covered by your insurance, as many as many insurance agencies uh, in in the industry voluntarily waived COVID copays and cost sharing obligations. There are some changes coming along with that, and, and to talk about that, we'll be joined by an, an expert on that matter, JJ Conway, the principal attorney and the founder of JJ Conway Law, joining us now on the MegaCast. Uh, JJ, thank you for being with us today. Sure. Nice to see you. Appreciate it. Uh, can you tell us a little bit about your law firm and what it does for employees all over the state of Michigan? All right. So uh, we are a boutique law firm. We're located in Royal Oak, uh, and we represent employees uh, and other interested parties in employee benefit disputes. So essentially, you can think of anything that happens in your employee benefit plan, health care, uh, insurances, or retirement uh, issues. We uh, handle those cases for employees when they run into problems. We're joined by J.J. Conway. He is the uh, founder and the principal attorney at the J.J. At JJ Conway Law, joining us today on the Megacast. And so, as I had mentioned, um, many uh, many in the insurance agency had voluntarily waived uh, co-pays uh, and cost-sharing obligations related to COVID-19. Uh, during the pandemic. Recently, uh, it was announced that uh, private insurers are eliminating these waivers uh, regardless of vaccination status. Uh, can you talk a little bit about what that means for employees uh, in the state of Michigan regarding their insurance benefits and what your law firm is doing or what some people can be doing with the help of a law firm like yours in order to combat this issue? Well, it, it, it's more of a, uh, a policy <clears throat> change. Obviously, <clears throat> when the pandemic first began, no one really knew uh, how to treat this condition. Uh, and so the insurance industry as a whole decided that it wouldn't be really fair to put the cost sharing obligations on the backs of their insurance. So they waived voluntarily uh, costs that were associated with COVID-19 treatments um, and diagnostic uh, testing, things like, of that nature. Once a vaccine became available uh, and readily available and free to uh, it, of people within the state of Michigan, the insurance industry changed their position in this. And they essentially said, okay, now there is a preventative measure. And if you don't avail yourself of that, then there is going to be an increased cost sharing obligation uh, that you will experience. So that's essentially what's, what's the big change. We're joined by J.J. Conway. He is the uh, he is the founder and the principal attorney at J.J. Conway Law, joining us today on the Megacast. And so, uh, J.J., uh, Delta Airlines recently began, they began charging an additional $200 a month uh, to employees who didn't qualify for an exemption uh, but, and yet chose not to be uh, vaccinated against COVID-19. Uh, on this front, how has that impacted the workforce at Delta? And is there any and other and other companies that may have similar policies? And uh, is there any sort of a legal issue with what they're doing, or any sort of legal gray area there that may affect other companies that are smaller, may not have as much of um, a, a backing, a significant backing from their own attorneys in order to enact these different policies? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, I think uh, look at. All employers, private employers uh, in particular, are trying to figure out a safe and appropriate way to navigate this situation. On the one hand, they've got to keep their workforce safe. Um, and on the other hand, they sort of have to respect the divergence of interests within this particular uh, area of whether you should be vaccinated or not. So Delta took a totally different course. They did not do a heavy handed approach. What they said is, okay, if you are vaccinated, it's business as usual. You'll have your same benefits. They'll continue uninterrupted. If you choose not to be vaccinated, there's going to be a financial uh, cost to that. And so assessing their employees on average $200 a month extra, in addition to whatever their deductibles and other cost sharing obligations are, uh, that was the decision they made. So it left it up to the employees to make a financial decision whether to do this or not. Interestingly, the Delta model, at least the early indication, seems, uh, seems to be working very effectively. Uh, they've gotten uh, better compliance than most of their peers uh, within the industry. 
We're joined by J.J. Conway, the principal attorney and the founder of J.J. Conway Law, joining us today on the Megacast. And as we go forward, and, and this pandemic continues on and onward and onward, and there seems to be, as, as time goes on, uh, no clear indication of where we begin to pull out of this pandemic and return to some sort of normalcy. And that creates a greater sense of urgency to protect your employees and to, in some cases, if people are not uh, complying with precautionary techniques, to put other measures in place that either counteract that or put some sort of disincentive in place um, to either encourage them to do so or to simply say, if you don't want to follow along with these particular precautions, that's fine, but there are going to be some consequences. From a legal standpoint, what should uh, companies that may be considering putting measures like Delta Airlines put in or like other companies have been putting in uh, to counteract those that are not taking precautions, what precautions should those companies be taking in planning to enact these policies to make sure that they are on solid legal ground but also are able to fulfill their obligation and their desire uh, to create a safe work environment and a safe environment for the customers as well, should that be the case? So one way to look at this is this is the first global pandemic of this nature in 100 years. And so there isn't a really firmly established rule book on what's right and what's wrong. And certainly the, the whole area of benefits law that came on the scene long after the last pandemic. So what you're trying to do is, as you point out, balance the various interests of all of the interested parties, be it your customer base, your employees, and uh, your, essentially your coworkers when you bring employees back on, on site. What I think employers are trying to do is figure out a way to navigate this uh, in, in such that they respect the divergence of views of people, but also make sure that their co-working spaces are safe and, and appropriate. And one of the ways that legally they seem to be able to do this is by adding financial incentives, either paying people to become vaccinated or putting a financial cost on, on the decision to not be vaccinated. And it seems to be, at least with the federal agencies that have weighed in on this issue, that seems to have the uh, legal blessing of the federal government. We're joined by J.J. Conway, principal attorney at J.J. Conway Law and also the founder of J.J. Conway Law as well. And so you mentioned benefits. Uh, what, what are, what's the future, uh, uh, in your opinion, of what you believe uh, employers will be providing their workers in terms of benefits, uh, particularly uh, such as fertility benefits? It seems like that's an increasingly important issue uh, to a larger number of employees who are seeking to either continue work with their current company or are seeking other jobs. Well, you know, when you looked at, at benefit plans from 30, 40 years ago, they used to have letters from the chief executive officer telling employees that their benefit plans were, quote, their hidden paycheck. And it turns out that benefits account for around a third of people's compensation. It's a very effective way to deliver compensation to employees that tends to be tax-free in, in many, many instances. So what is very unique about this particular period in time is that there is a, a tight labor market. There's an emphasis on providing competitive benefits uh, for employers to uh, attract employees. Now, you mentioned the fertility treatment benefits. Um, that's a very costly and expensive uh, elective medical procedure. Most plans have not covered that. They've written it out as an exclusion. But as people begin to uh, assess their options in a tight labor market, and you have two employers that are offering two totally different benefit plans, one that provides the benefit and one that doesn't, uh, employers are finding that the benefit packages are the way to become increasingly competitive in hiring. We're joined by J.J. Conway, principal attorney and the founder of J.J. Conway Law, joining us today on the Megacast. Uh, and what, what about for, uh, what about benefits and coverage, particularly uh, health insurance-wise, for employees' children? Um, uh, how about teens with, uh, they're suffering from something like an eating disorder? Is this something that is currently covered by most or, or, uh, or on average by insurance providers, or is it not something that is covered, something like an eating disorder or other similar mental health and also physical health related issues? As you just alluded to a, a moment ago, the, the, with the emphasis on where benefit plans are in terms of, let's say, what their values are, there seems to be an increased focus on not only the creation of families, but the appropriate care for families. And this issue is uh, an issue that is, is not something necessarily that employers are having to offer. They already are mandated to offer it. 
and, and they should be offering it. The issue has been is that insurance companies have been giving parents a very difficult time in providing for the mental health of their children. Uh, and the children are every bit entitled to these benefits as their adult parents. So parents have increasingly uh, encountered problems. And so this is an area within benefits law where the courts are now starting to get involved. They're looking at the existing policies, they're looking at the existing plans, and they're holding the insurers and the employers to account to make sure that children are getting the necessary mental health treatment uh, that they need, as you alluded to, for a, a very serious condition like an eating disorder. We're joined by J.J. Conway. He is the principal attorney uh, and the founder of J.J. Conway Law. Joining us today on the Megacast, uh, J.J., just another few minutes with you today before we'll say goodbye. At this moment in time, uh, are there any other uh, significant changes or significant considerations that are being uh, put to thought by insurance providers or by employers as they're considering re-upping with their insurance provider or switching providers uh, that employees, potential employees, or the general public should be aware of at this time or anything else that we haven't discussed today that you think would be of importance or interest? You know, Tyler, people always dread open enrollment periods. That's always, it's, it's, it seems very bureaucratic. It seems like it's gonna be uh, uh, you know, time consuming, but it's worth maybe taking a Sunday afternoon, sitting there and going through the different benefit options for the coming year uh, if you're an employee, trying to look at what your health care needs are, what the needs of your family are, and then look at what the companies are offering and make the decisions accordingly. It's probably two or three hours, but it's time very well spent. Well, JJ, we appreciate your insight uh, and clarification on a lot of these issues uh, and, and these moving parts that are changing in the insurance agency uh, and certainly among employers and by, and by trade affecting our employees all throughout the state of Michigan and around the country as well. So thank you for, for your help. Thank you. Appreciate it. Again, J.J. Conway, he is the founder and the, and the principal attorney at J.J. Conway Law with us on the Megacast. We're going to take a break, and on the other side, we'll continue the show on your radio homes for the Megacast, 89.3 WBLD, Orchard Lake, West Bloomfield, Kego Harbor, Sylvan Lake, and 88.1 WBFH, Bloomfield Hills. After the break, we'll be talking financial planning once again with Rick Bloom of uh, Bloom Advisors as we head into the holiday season and the end of the year. What what should you be doing to get your finances in order as we head into 2022? We'll learn more about that. Coming up next, you're watching and listening to the Megacast. You see certain things get reincarnated in your children. My daughter is very much inspired by my wife's artistic pursuits. So my daughter started making necklaces. She makes what we call affirmation fashion. I tell her every day that your black is beautiful. Your black is beautiful. Your black is beautiful. And if there's anything better than being beautiful, it's being smart. And if there's anything better than being smart, it's being kind. And reaffirming that every day is our method of making sure her chin never drops. My dad wasn't around. And I remember riding a bike and falling off and cutting myself. And me never would just want to get back on it. People ask, how your children learn how to ride a bike? And you did. I didn't teach them. I just created an environment where they taught themselves, and all I had to do was be there. Whether you're the city, the county, or the Huron River Watershed Council. As partners working together to protect our water resources, we agree. Pet waste is a source of harmful bacteria in the Huron River. When it's left on the ground, it can wash into the storm drains. These lead directly to our streams. No filters, no treatment. Here's one thing we know that can help keep our water clean. Pick up pet waste and trash it. Pick up pet waste and trash it. So pick up pet waste and trash it. There's one water and it's ours to protect. Who is struggling right now? I am. My son is. Many are struggling with anxiety, depression, and substance use. Before it becomes a crisis, reach out to MyCal the Michigan Crisis and Access Line for free confidential support 24-7. Available in the Upper Peninsula in Oakland County. Just call or text 1-844-44-MICAL or chat online at michigan.gov slash mycal. A message from the Michigan Department of Health and Human Services. Motorcyclists are hard to see. To keep everyone safer, it's important to always look for them and know where most crashes occur. 
84% of motorcycle and vehicle crashes happen on streets, not highways. And most crashes with motorcyclists occur when vehicle drivers are turning left. So before turning, especially to the left, make sure you look for motorcyclists. Then look again. It could save a life. To Sofia and Gabriel, even though these old knees can't follow on your adventure to the forest today, these flowers represent my love. These stitches and threads join us together. And wherever you see a flower, a bird, a beautiful tree, know that my love is with you. Make the forest part of your story at a park near you. Find one at discovertheforest.org. 72.7% of high school students get less than the recommended 7 to 9 hours of sleep a night. This can cause pain, obesity, and can very negatively affect your mental health. When you have a consistent 7 to 9 hours of sleep every day, you get sick less often, lose more weight, and have better relationships with those around you. For more information about the dangers of sleep deprivation, go to sleepfoundation.org. This message is brought to you by the WBHS Digital Media Arts Program and 89.3 Lakes FM. Can I ask you a question? Why did you get your kids vaccinated? It was hard for them to social distance, to be isolated from their friends. I want them to get back to school and sports games. So as a pediatrician, I recommend the vaccine to everyone I know. The boys lost a former teammate and classmate who was only 20 years old. It's been a devastating year. We want to get back to normalcy. Our daughter is really looking forward to being with her friends, being a kid. Welcome back to the Megacast. I'm Tyler Keeft here in our studios in West Bloomfield, although we broadcast all throughout uh, Oakland County, where we originate our broadcast, of course, and all throughout the state of Michigan here on the Megacast, Monday through Friday, 10 a.m. until 12 noon. You can learn more information about our show, including everywhere that we broadcast live and live to tape, and find us on demand on civiccentertv.com slash megacast. Uh, joining us now as we approach the end of the year, it's time to get your finances in order for both the end of the 2021 uh, calendar and fiscal year as well as, as as you prepare for 2022 and joining us now to provide some tips on how you can best approach that is Rick Bloom a financial advisor with Bloom Advisors back with us once again on the Megacast. Rick thank you for being with us. Well thanks so much for having me it's a privilege to be here again. Appreciate having you with us. So, Rick, uh, as we are in the thick of the holiday season, people are doing their holiday shopping. They're getting ready for a large family get-togethers like they had with Thanksgiving, like they'll have during the other holidays throughout the month of December and uh, and, and New Year and the New Year as we head into January as well. That can be tough for people to stay on budget, however, because they're doing so much spending outside of the norm, particularly in the month of December and even late into November. Uh, what advice do you have for folks that are trying to keep their financial life in order? During during the holiday season, especially as we're getting toward year end? You know, the first thing I always tell them is you gotta have a game plan about how much you're gonna spend during the holidays. And remember, you don't have to buy a gift for everyone you know. Uh, people have to be more prudent with their money. So I think before you even start the, the holiday shopping process, you should know who you're gonna buy gifts for, and there should be a budget that you need to stay within. The problem that we have is we have so many people that charge their holiday gifts, and it takes a whole year to pay it off. So you now have people that are just paying off their 2020 holiday gifts, which you can't do. So I think the, the most important thing is to set a budget, stay within that budget. And remember, so many, most people you're gonna buy gifts for who love you, they don't want you going into financial ruin to give them a gift. So people should be more creative these days, but they have to make sure they watch that bottom line. My general view is you should never put anything on a charge card that you cannot afford to pay when that bill comes due because the interest rate on charge cards is outrageous. I mean, think about this, Tyler. You put money in the bank, you're lucky to get 1%. You charge it on your charge card, you're paying at least 18.5%. So it never makes sense to loan money out at less than 1% and borrow it at 18.5%. If you cannot afford to pay that charge card bill when it comes due, don't buy the item. We're joined by Rick Bloom. He is a financial advisor 
uh, and uh, sorry, with uh, Bloom Advisors joining us on the MegaCast. You can also find uh, uh, his Money Matters column for Home Life newspapers on hometownlife.com. Uh, and so uh, on, on top of the additional spending that's uh, typical for many during the late area of November and, and through December and the holidays each year, uh, now especially uh, given the pandemic, given the last couple of years that we've been through and just the nature of today's society, a lot more that shopping is also being done online. What advice do you have uh, for your clients and for the general public and how they can keep their finances uh, both in order with online shopping but also safe as well uh, from the cybersecurity standpoint? Well, you hit, the, you hit the nail right on the head when you said safe. The most important thing when you're going online is to only go to reputable sites. I mean, it's not who has the cheapest product, but it's the most reputable site. And you need to make sure that you do your homework on that site before you provide them any information. And you know, the same thing comes this time of year with charities. You know, Americans are the most charitable people on earth, and we give. And so what happens, the crooks know that too. And this time of year, we're all getting emails. It's either with kids that pull out our heartstrings or dogs, and people automatically sign up for it. You can't do that. You have to be smarter these days. My general rule is when I get an email, I never link from that email unless I'm 100% sure I know that site. I'd much rather type it into my browser. And especially when it comes to things like charities, you have to check the charity out before you send them your money. Uh, places like give.org, charitynavigator.org provide a lot of independent information on charities that you need to check out before you give them your charge card. It, in the old days, Jesse James had to put a gun to you to rob you. Today, it's much easier than that, and they're coming from all over the world, so you cannot be so too safe when it comes with uh, your charge card and your sensitive information online. And, and the other thing is, this time of year, especially with charities, we're getting a lot of phone calls. You know, phone solicitations. My general rule, I never give to a phone solicitor, never. Even if I think it's a good charity, I won't give through the phone solicitor. I'll you know, go on the website, do my homework, check it out, and give through there. And there's a reason for that. One, so many of these phone solicitations are just scams, and they're meant to get your information. But even ones that are from legitimate charities, the problem is upwards of half the money you give goes to the phone solicitor as opposed to the charitable organization. Most of us want to make sure when we give to a charity, you know, we believe in that cause. We want that money going to accomplish that cause. We don't want it to go to salespeople. So you cannot be too safe when you, you go online. And my number one advice, it's not the cheapest because you can always find something cheapest and, and that's where people run into problems. They think, oh my God, this is selling for $200 everywhere. I can get it for $50. Well, there's a reason for that. And also, you know, there's a lot of fraudulent goods on the market these days that you think you're getting an original product, but you're not. So you really have to keep your guard up, you know, when you go online. And, and the way I, I tell people is only use reputable sites. If you've never heard of the site and, you know, you can't get independent information from it, walk away from it. Yeah, and on that front, too, with the phone callers, it's, it's something that's uh, similar to uh, what we see, what, what the advice we see from the Better Business Bureau and other uh, entities uh, in, in regard to companies that may be calling saying, hey, there's a there's been a charge on your account with Amazon or with Target or with or with Walmart or, or with you know any of these different businesses. Their advice is to don't do anything over that phone call. Don't do anything with that email. Uh, go to the company's website, log into your account, or call your local store individually and continue that process. And a see if that was for, if that call was for real, uh, and if that incident is true. Sim similar thing with with the giving with the charities. If someone's calling you. Uh, 
from a, through a phone solicitation, uh, the safer way to go about that would, would be to tell the person on the phone, if you're interested in donating to that charity, to say, okay, I, I, I just want to make sure that it, I am going through all my checks and doing this as safe as possible, so I'm going to hang up and I'm going to call this charity back individually, but I will be making a donation. And anybody on the other side of that line that is not encouraging you to do that is probably not looking out for your best interests or the best interests of that charity and all the more reason why you say with regard to commissions it may not be your best choice right and you know let me just also say about that is if you ever get an email from an entity like the irs ignore it yeah don't even respond to it i mean uh, we've seen a lot in oakland county a lot of people have been taken by um, all sorts of frauds when it comes to the irs the irs is not going to email you they're not going to call you on the phone they're going to send you a letter. So if you get a call, and it happens to a lot of seniors in our area, that they owe money and they have to pay it immediately, they're going to be arrested. Well, hang up. And even if it says IRS, Internal Revenue Service, on the caller ID, the crooks are smart these days, but we have to be smarter. So the same advice applies whether it's the IRS or the state of Michigan taxing authorities. So if you get an email, ignore it. Yeah, and they're able to. They're able to because so much of our phone systems are digital, especially our cell phones, and we have automatic caller ID on them that is, that is based on the origination of the call and, and the device that that's from. They're able to what's called spoof their caller ID and you know, make it appear like you said, like they're calling from Internal Revenue so Service or IRS or, or some other agency that then you see that on your caller ID and you think this is legitimate and don't, right. and then you let your guard down and here they are, they have access to your, to your right. information. They may either, you know, wipe and it. It's, wipe it's, and once they get that information, it's amazing what they can do. You know, they can open charge cards in your name, and it causes all sorts of problems. And what people should also recognize, everyone thinks it's just the elderly that gets taken advantage on these scams. It's not. You know, it's millennials. It's across the board. And it's even, especially in identity theft, one of the fastest growing areas is against newborns, is people stealing the identity of newborns. So, you have to keep your, you know, cautious. And if something doesn't seem right, you need to check it out. Don't assume that it's no big deal because it is. We're joined by Rick Bloom. He is a financial advisor with Bloom Advisors, joining us today on the MegaCast. And so, in, t in terms of precautions or protections, um, are there any that you can put in place with your bank accounts, with your investments, ac investment accounts, with your personal information like your social security number and your credit, uh, any sort of precautionary uh, protections that you can put in place to help you avoid um, your information if it is breached from, well, from, it from is. Uh, having you know, issues? Just like all, uh, most of the brokerage houses these days and the same thing with charge card companies will send you notices whenever there's activity on your account. And, and I recommend people sign up for that. And I use an example with me. I have notice on my charge card that any activity. So I once a few years ago got a, a notice from my charge card that someone charged a dollar on my charge card. Well, most people would ignore that, but I know that's a sign that someone had breached my uh, charge because I don't charge anything for a dollar. So I immediately contacted the company and put a hold on it and you know got a whole new card and stuff like that. You and I today have to be proactive and take advantage of these notices. And I'd also say like on your brokerage accounts to sign up for two-factor identification. It's a little bit of a hassle, but it's something that we need to do. You know, we tend to think that, you know, it's not gonna be me, I'm not the wealthiest or this or that. It happens to every one of us. We're all a potential victims to identity theft. So, you know, you have to take security seriously. Two-factor identification is important, but also putting notices on all those accounts, any, no any activity that you're gonna be getting notice on, and if you didn't do it, you need to contact them immediately. Yeah, and then there are other protections also that you can put on uh, your social security num uh, social security number and information and your credit information with the credit bureaus. Credit bureau. precautionary, uh, precautionary. Right. You don't ne necessarily need to have some sort of incident to prove to them that you need this protection. You can just do it, and then they're notifying you when there's any sort of an attempt, even of an inquiry. 
And, and, you know, I'll give you an example. I have all three of my, on the uh, major credit bureaus, I have my account frozen on all three of them. So if I ever need to, you know, I'm getting a new car, so they have to run my credit or something, I'll unfreeze it for that short period of time and then refreeze it. Um, it's a hassle, but you know what? It's worth it because if your identity is stolen, it gets to be a major, major hassle, and it is expensive to resolve it. And it just doesn't happen overnight. It can take years and years really to overcome that. Yeah, it can, and so uh, you, you want to be able to take that action right away or precautionary, take that re take that action so that uh, if there is an incident, you know about it right away because oftentimes, like you said, there will be these little tests that come through, whether it be a $1 right. charge on your charge card that kind of gives them a test of is this the information I'm looking for, does this work, or an inquiry made on your credit that then goes through and ends up being an account that you get charges racked up on, and that right. can have a huge impact on your finances. And and I'd also tell people what I tell them to do all the time, you get a statement, review it for accuracy. And if there's a mistake, contact that company who issued the statement immediately. Uh, when you get, let's say, your 401k statement, you'll get it at the beginning of January. You should make sure that you know all your deposits were accurately uh, accounted for, and that if there are any withdrawals that you have, that they're on there. But if you didn't have any withdrawals and then they show up on there, you know there's a problem. Mistakes do happen. People think banks don't make mistakes and big financial companies don't make mistakes. They do. And you and I are our last line of defense. So we have to be proactive. We get a statement. We should review it for accuracy. We're joined by Rick Bloom of Bloom Advisors today on the Megacast. And uh, Rick, uh, at this point in time, many people are changing jobs. Uh, we've had mass resignations. Uh, people that have been leaving jobs for other jobs. There are a lot of job openings as well. And as people are transitioning uh, from one job to another, they may have a potential to leave their company through a buyout. What should people who are offered buyouts be taken into consideration before they either accept that buyout or continue the negotiation about potentially leaving their job? Right. Well, I think that, first of all, everyone has to look at their own individual situation. Um, everyone likes to think, well, what is everyone else doing? Well, that's immaterial. You need to look at your own individual situation, particularly some of the buyouts that we've seen recently through the auto industry. You have to look at your situation saying, am I going to retire anyways? If you're going to retire anyways, you know, then those buyouts sometimes are worthwhile. If you're not going to retire, if you plan to work for a few years, some of those bios aren't so good. So I think the key is to look at your own individual situation and then to decide if I'm going to retire, do I have the income to retire or am I gonna to have to get another job? Yes, jobs are plentiful, but we also have to realize that for seniors or really people over 50, sometimes the job market is very difficult. I think you need to look at also, what benefits are, are they providing you? Are they providing you health care for a period of time? It's just not the buyout number. As you mentioned, it's about all the perks that uh, are also go along with it. Um, but I think individually, you have to look at it in your own individual situation, you know, to coordinate with your spouse and things of that nature. There's, I've seen so many buyout offers uh, in my career. Some are good, some aren't so good. Uh, but the most important thing is look at your own individual situation. We're joined by Rick Bloom of Bloom Advisors today on the Megacast. And uh, Rick, uh, end of the year, beginning of the new year, it, it becomes time for people to also be considering uh, their health insurance, especially if they've switched jobs or employment situations as well. Uh, early December is uh, when we see the deadline for Medicare open enrollment. Do uh, you have any advice for people who are trying to uh, navigate that uh, that open often space and that often confusing landscape it, of, of health care benefits. It is confusing, particularly for Medicare D prescription drug plan. And what I always tell people is on the Medicare website, there is a prescription drug finder. It is a very good uh, tool to help you figure out what's best for you. And that's where I tell people to start. And also when it comes to prescription drug plan, a lot of people think husband and wife need to sign up for the same plan and they don't you need to look at your own situation individually. And don't assume that the plan you had last year is just as good as this year. Plans change and also let's face facts, our healthcare situation changes. 
And so you have to look at this anew. But I would tell people that Medicare.gov, the prescription drug finder, is a wonderful place to uh, uh, to begin your search. They have a wealth of information. And for a lot of people, it is relatively easy because you're typing in your uh, prescriptions and they're then providing what plans are covered through those. It gets a little more difficult for someone that has multiple, you know, many drugs. Then it gets a little more difficult. We're joined by Rick Bloom of Bloom Advisors uh, on the Megacast. Rick, just another couple minutes before we'll say goodbye today. Any other uh, advice as we head into the thick of the holiday yeah. seasons and approach the end of the year? Well, I'll tell you one thing I think everyone should do is look at their own individual situation, decide whether they should do a Roth conversion. You know, Roth conversions provide great opportunities. The benefit is Roth IRAs are not subject to income tax. So when you withdraw money from a Roth IRA, it's tax free. In addition, Roth IRAs are not subject to minimum required distributions. So you can let money grow tax free for as long as you choose. And if you pass away, that money goes to your uh, beneficiaries income tax free. So I think and no matter what age you're at, you should look at doing a, a Roth conversion. And my general rules are one, you have to have the money to pay the tax without touching the money you're converting. Two, by converting the money, it won't throw you into a higher tax bracket. And three, that you can generally leave it there at least five years. If you meet those three criteria, it makes sense to take advantage of a Roth conversion. And particularly someone that may find that in 2021, they're in a lower tax bracket because of job situation than they normally would, it gives them an opportunity. So I think it's a great opportunity to convert tax deferred money into tax free money. People should take advantage of Roth IRAs, Roth conversions. Well, Rick, we appreciate your time. Thank you for your, your advice as we head into the end of the year and people uh, work to get their finances in order heading into 2022. Well, thank you so much and a happy uh, holiday season to all your listeners. You as well. Rick Bloom from Bloom Advisors. You can learn more information and get in contact with them for, for more advice and insight at bloomadvisors.com. And you can also read uh, Rick's weekly Money Matters column for, for Hometown Life newspapers on hometownlife.com. We're going to take a quick break. On the other side, we'll talk to one of our uh, great local charities and nonprofits, uh, Filthy Cares from uh, music producer Filthy Rockwell. He'll be joining me next to talk about his, his nonprofit on the Megacast. It's the Great Lakes water. And so what people do ends up in our waterways. Flushable wipes are just evil. <laughs> they should be thrown away. They're impossible to destroy and they can cause significant problems. One of the main things when you're cooking is to not dump fats, oils, and greases down your drains. They stick to the sides of pipes. They stick to everything they come in contact with. Don't put it down the sink. There's one water and it's ours to protect. When times get dark, we can't see the help that's all around us. When you don't know where to turn, let 211 be your guiding light. Two one one, how can I help you? Our guides are ready to connect you with the help you need. Resources. Call 211 or visit 211.org. 211. Get connected, get help. Filthy Cares, another uh, uh, nonprofit and charity organization supported by Share Detroit on this Giving Tuesday. Filthy Rockwell is now with us on the Megacast. Filthy, thank you for being with us today. Thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you for having me. Appreciate having you on. So uh, you have a, an interesting background. You're a Grammy-nominated musician. Uh, you've worked with some big-name uh, artists as, as well. Tell us a little bit about your background and then uh, a little bit about your organization as well. Um, yeah, I've worked with um some um I've worked with Kanye West. I um, I got nominated for a Grammy for working with Kanye West. Um I've worked with um I helped develop Big Shine. Um 
I've worked with Royce to Five Nine, um, George Clinton, um, a couple of artists, a couple of other artists. Um, I've been producing for um, since 2007, probably around 2007. So, you know, just working my way through the, um, you know, through the trenches. So, the music so and how has your experience as a, as a prolific music producer and, and a songwriter, uh, how has that led you into d developing Filthy Cares and uh, inspired the services that you provide in the community? Um, well, <clears throat> Well, well, after I, well, after I had, um, got my um, placements, you know what I'm saying, find my way in the industry and got my placements and was working in the industry, um, I started taking my money and just investing in my clothing brand. I started a brand. Um, Detroit, we have a saying in Detroit, what up, though? That's how we greet each other in Detroit. And, you know, now it's become, you know, an international thing. Everybody's saying it now. But, you know, in Detroit, it's a term of endearment. And um, I, I turned that into a brand in um, 2014. And I took that, you know, and just work and just working my brand, and I was using my brand to just do things in the community. So um, around two years ago, um, I had an I well, well, I had an idea as a kid. Um, sometimes I didn't get a gift. Um, so sometimes I'm, I, you know, we wish that you know somebody would knock on the door with a gift. So it was an idea. So as I was doing pop ups with my brand, one day I just was talking to my partners about it and about doing, um, you know, just this idea I had. You know, we was gonna do a pop, we was gonna do a pop up um, for the holidays. You know, take the money from the pop up, buy gifts, and uh, you know, wrap them and deliver them. It was just an idea, but. You know, everybody was enthused about it, so we like, all right, well, let's do it. So we did it. So we we executed it. We did a pop up at a Detroit Shipping Company. This is all that had already started. You know, um, we did a pop up at Detroit Shipping Company. You know, we we put a set up a donation box there, and within a month, you know, we had a box full of toys and stuff, and we was like, wow, it actually worked. So now we got to you know wrap these toys because it was important to me that we wrap the toys because we couldn't just. You know, just give it. So we had to wrap the toys. So we all, we, you know, me and my partner in crime. You know, um, we um, we wrapped the toys the, um, the night the night before. We wrapped all the toys. Um, Chris, um, um, you know, Christmas Eve. Next morning, we took the toys door to door, um, and we named it Adopt the Block. And we've been doing it yearly. So last year for the pandemic, you know, it was like really important we did it. But the first year we did it, I know, you know, it's long, but the first year we did it, um, what we realized was some of the doors we knocked on, they didn't have food in the house, you know, some of the houses. So it was like, oh, well, we have to bring food next time. So the next, so the next year was last year was, you know, when the pandemic was going on. So I just felt like it was imperative that we did it. So we, um, you know, we got together, you know, that's the, when I first, last year, I opened up my, um, my, um, my, my store, um, man, I'm, I'm, it's 20, uh, yeah, 2020, we opened up a store on Holden street, um, 13, 12 filthy Americans is that's the name of the uh, store where the brand is at. And that's where I do a lot of um, the community work we do out of there too. Um, uh, it's 1312 Holden Street. So we opened that November 18th last year. So that's where we started collecting a lot of the donations. We do a lot of um, work out of there. And from there, we took this, you know, from there, you know, we got a lot of attention in the community. A lot of people, um, it was the biggest year of Adopt the Block last year was because we had a, a home base to do it from. And, you know, I mean, it's where I sell my brand out of. We do, um, you know, pop-ups. We do um, shows out of there and stuff like that, too. But when they came, when all the, um, you know, all the donations came in and we set up boxes at Clutch and Throttle, too, um, that was another place we uh, set up boxes. It was so many gifts and stuff that we had. It took us to, like, 7 o'clock. Christmas night to be done delivering everything. So um, that's how it all started. And, you know, this year is our official year being an um, official nonprofit. So, you know, it's, you know, it's a, it's an amazing ride, but it all started with just an idea. But every year I'm, you know, it's like needed that we do it. So it's like become a, a mission of mine to do it. But, you know, we do other projects throughout the year. 
And you can learn more information about Filthy Cares by going to sharedetroit.org slash nonprofit uh, slash filthy hyphen cares. Or just search Filthy Cares on sharedetroit.org. There you'll learn more information about everything that this 501c3 nonprofit does uh, to support the community. Uh, you can also find volunteer opportunities, at upcoming events uh, as well, and, and uh, their gift shop wish list uh, so that you can purchase items that they may be able to uh, help provide to people uh, all throughout the Detroit area. Area. Again, it's uh, Filthy Cares is the name of the organization, sharedetroit.com uh, to learn more. Or you can go to Filthy's website, filthyamericans.com slash pages slash filthy hyphen cares. We're joined by Filthy Rockwell. He is the founder of, of Filthy Cares, joining us today uh, on the Megacast. So you mentioned your shop and event space. It's the uh, Filthy Americans Arts and Cultural Center. Um, you mentioned some of the yes. items that you sell there, but what, uh, the musical opportunities that you also provide there, uh, who are those open to and what are some of those opportunities that are open to people in the community um well we um well since we've been open um we've um well i, I just i really just started doing um because we had, we did shows there we i brought keith murray there last year um we um we did a christmas we had a, did a christmas show there last year um we've done we i brought all the dj a lot of the djs from the community have come out a lot of the djs from the radio like you know, I've been hosting a lot of things at the, and I'm doing um, open mic nights at the um, space. Um, I brought a DJ in, DJ Beck. A few of the DJs from the community came in, and we're we're working on a way to teach kids how to DJ. Um, bring kids in, teach them how to DJ, teach them how to use music programs, because stuff like this didn't exist when I was young. So we want to, you know, take our, you know, take the things we've learned and share it with the community. It's not just kids either, like bring other people in, other instructors, people, you know, if you know, you know, whatever, you know, whatever program it is that you use, if you, are, you know, you, you, you expert at it, we bring you in and you can help us teach other kids or people in the community that want to learn how to, you, you know, DJ or, you know, any other, you know, any other things that we um, offer. You know, we um, we work. It's also a skate shop. My space is also it's the first skate shop in Detroit. So, um, you know, we also have an instructor to help people with you know learn how to skate. We had a skate shop, a skate park right outside the um, the, the uh, space, but it got um, it shut down right now because of um, construct. It's a lot of construction being going on in the area. But you know, we offer like. You know, all my friends that do anything cool, you know, if you come around, you got to be willing to uh, give up your time and teach the, the people and teach the community how to, um, you know, give, you know, whatever it is you know how to do. So whatever it is, like, you come to our space, like, it's available for you to learn how to do it there if we have people around that, you know. But music is, you know, me and my partner, that's our, like, you know, that's our thing. So engineering, you know, um, stuff like that, um, producing, you know, teaching kids how to use drum machines, music programs. That's what, you know, where my expertise is. We're joined by Filthy Rockwell. He's the founder of Filthy Cares, a Share Detroit supported charity and nonprofit. You can learn more information by going to sharedetroit.org uh, and uh, searching Filthy Cares to learn more information about the organization, ways that you can participate in volunteer opportunities, and other ways that you can donate and support uh, the organ donate to and support the organization as well. You can also learn more information about uh, Filthy Cares, a 501c3 nonprofit, by going to uh, Filthy Rockwell website at filthyamericans.com and so uh, filthy heading back uh, into uh, adopt a block um, there are multiple ways that people can participate in in, in, uh, in this effort uh, that you do annually either by donating different uh, 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 different items that may be provided as gifts uh, to to uh, people in these homes in Detroit, or by adopting a block, so to so to speak. What are some different ways? Uh, tell us more about those different ways that people can participate in the Adopt a Block this year. Okay. Well, um, we have we have a few donation boxes set up. We have um, one set up at Ivy Kitchen. We have um, one set up um, at Detroit Clutch and Throttle. Um, we have one, we have a few set up. Um, well, I, I have to get the other places. Uh, we have them set up at, but we have one set up in, um, at our own space in Filthy Americans. And, you know, we're just looking for the community to bring um, new toys in, not old toys. We need brand new toys so we can, you know, we got we got some, some great gifts this year too. Um, but, you know, we want to, um, you know, we want to, you know, we want to give the kids a, a great gift. You know what I'm saying? It's nothing like opening up 
one of the, your favorite toys. They even got some of those, uh, the, the Hello Dolls, like whatever that is, like all the kids going crazy for, we even got some of those. So, you know, we super excited to deliver um, those toys. Last year, we was able to uh, deliver um, um, a few families' TVs, like, and that was really an amazing experience to knock on the door. And, you know, we went back, you know, and gave, and, and you know, we, we picked, we, we went through the doors and delivered our toys and, you know, and our non-perishables. That's another uh, another way you can, um, non-perishables, but um, mostly um, toys is, um, but non-perishables is another thing um, we, we um, deliver, we, um, you know, we, we accept to donations, you know, because that helps us to, well, because this is not the only thing we do. Um, throughout the year, but that's the effort we're doing right now. Is um right now, but throughout the year we do other um you know other pro other things we come up with in the community to help the community too. But right now it's just about Christmas and you know an adopt an adopt the block. But we do it as as many toys and as much stuff as we get. We that's more blocks we pick. So you know we just you know we it's it's growing bigger too. Like last year was the first year we started it was like two blocks in one project. Last year it was like three plot three projects and in, in multiple blocks next to the projects because we had so much stuff we had to knock on the doors and and give it out and it's just an amazing experience we need volunteers to people to come help us like you know because we don't have a lot of stuff to share so uh, again yeah, that's you the uh, and again, you can learn more information about how you can uh, both donate to Filthy Cares and those volunteer opportunities that Filthy just said are so important uh, this season and year-round for Filthy Cares by going to Share Detroit's website, sharedetroit.org. Just search for Filthy Cares uh, on that website. You can also learn more information at their website uh, at filthyamericans.com slash pages slash filthy hyphen cares uh, to go directly to their website. And then uh, the phone number provided by Filthy Cares, 248-291-7589. That's 248-291-7589. And again, uh, donation locations uh, for new items or gently, very gently used items uh, include better health markets across uh, Metro Detroit here in, the, in our originating point in Oakland County. Many of those uh, across the county, including uh, Bloomfield Township, Beverly Hills, Novi, uh, and Livonia. Also Detroit Clutch and Throttle on Bobian uh, Boulevard in Detroit, as well as the Filthy Americans Arts and Cultural Center located on Holden Street in Detroit uh, as well. And so, um, Another thing coming up, Filthy, is you have a, a big party on December 23rd. Uh, it's, a, it's both a yeah. wrapping in terms of Christmas <laughs> Christmas gifts and holiday gifts and a wrapping and musical party as well. Tell us a little bit about that event coming up on December 23rd. Okay, yeah. December 23rd, we um, we have um, National Recording Artist. He's um, Grammy, Grammy, Grammy winning artist uh, Keith Murray is going to come in town. It's Murray Murray Christmas. Last year we had Murray Murray Christmas. This year we're going to have Murray Murray Christmas again. And um, he's gonna come in, he's gonna perform on the 23rd. We're gonna um, have a community come in and help us wrap gifts. We, we gonna start wrapping gifts now because a lot of stuff is already coming in. So, um, but we gonna have a community come in and help us wrap gifts and, to, and come to the wrap party where Keith Murray is gonna come and perform. And he's gonna come door to door with us and deliver the gifts this year too. Cause last year he was mad at me cause I didn't tell him about it. I didn't think, uh, uh, you know, a national artist would wanna come door to door in the snow with me and deliver gifts, but he's enthused to do it. So that's what the 23rd is about. You know, everybody coming out and just enjoying themselves, you know, coming to the space, um, 1312 Holden Street, um, come out and enjoy, enjoy the festivities. We gonna have, um, we gonna have um, food, you know, um, refreshments and, you know, and yeah, we gonna have a good time and come out and help us wrap some gifts and, and you know, if y'all want to come out on December the twenty fifth, if any y'all got any time, I know it's you know the holiday, but anybody that want to come out, and, you know, help us deliver gifts. We open it, you know, we need to help y'all. Again, those events, the uh, Christmas wrapping party is on uh, December 23rd, 3 p.m. to 7 p.m. at uh, the Filthy Americans Arts and Preservation Center, uh, located at 1312 Holden Street in Detroit. That December 25th event, the Christmas toy giveaway, also located at the same location. That is uh, Saturday, December 25th, Christmas Day, 9 a.m. until 3 p.m. Again, we're joined by Filthy Rockwell, the founder of Filthy Cares, a shared Detroit-supported charity and non 
and profit on this Giving Tuesday. Uh, and so, Filthy, another couple minutes with you today before we'll say goodbye. Anything else uh, that would be important for our audience to know about your organization or the best ways that they can help uh, everything that you do with Filthy Cares at this time? Um, well, you know, right right now it's about adopt a block, but um, throughout the year we always doing programs through Filthy Cares. Um, Cause you know, we, we, we looking to rebuild the skate park outside our space on Holden Street. So, you know, we've been raising money throughout the year to, um, you know, to um, build up, you know, so we can rebuild the skate park as soon as it's we're able to get over in there and start working in there. But we got uh, the community, uh, community push. Uh, that's the uh, guys that build all the skate parks in Detroit. They're another um, nonprofit. They um, they support us. They don't. They're, they're the guys that's going to do the work to rebuild the skate park. So that's what we're working on. So throughout the year we do shows. Last year we had brought um, the you know the creator of techno, Juan Atkins out. We had Juan Atkins in Ox 88 in May. We did a festival for the community. So we had like maybe 10 acts, but all national artists, you know, all, all you know, national um, techno artists, they all came out and they all, you know, performed for the community. Um, and it was a great, it was a great turnout. Like, like 900 people came out there. That was last summer. And we're going to do another one this summer. It's going to be, you know, May, May 28th is when it starts. That's going to be our festival this year. So, you know, just, you know, follow Filthy Americans, Filthy Cares, um, Filthy Rockwell on Instagram. Um, follow me on Instagram, follow Filthy Amer Filthy Cares on Instagram, and our and Filthy Americans is on Instagram. So, you know, and stay up to date with us and, you know, just support the cause because, um, you know, we're going to keep on, you know, doing what we do here in Detroit. And thank everybody for your support and thank you all for having me. We may come from different organizations, but we work together to protect the Huron River for everyone. Neighborhood storm drains carry water directly to local creeks and streams. No filters, no treatment. Storm drains also help reduce street flooding when it rains. So clearing storm drains and the areas nearby of trash and leaves helps keep them for rain only. It is easy to do your part by adopting a storm drain. Find a storm drain, check it, and clear it every month. So keep storm drains for rain only. There's one water, and it's ours to protect. If you are struggling to afford your internet bills during the pandemic, there's a temporary government program that may be able to help. It's called the Emergency Broadband Benefit, and it provides up to a $50 monthly discount on your broadband bill to qualifying households. Find more information about the program, including if you qualify and how to enroll at FCC.gov slash broadband benefit or call toll free at 833-511-0311. A public service announcement from 89.3. Lakes FM. We as Michiganders feel connected to this resource in a way that I think is really powerful. Conservation starts with a caring, committed community. For me, you know, it's peaceful to have a relationship with the river. Every single one of us has a role to make sure that those waterways stay safe and healthy, being careful about what goes down the storm drain. Just even eliminating some of your single-use plastic makes a difference. There's one water, and it's ours to protect. Did you know that nearly 3.31 million Americans don't get their annual checkup? <laughs> Going to the doctor regularly is extremely important and is a crucial factor in maintaining good health. Make sure you are visiting your local doctor often and telling them about any health concerns you have. For more information, contact your local health care provider. This message is brought to you by WBHS Digital Media Arts Program and A9.3 Lakes of Town. People are getting out to walk and bike in higher numbers. More vulnerable road users and higher speed traffic can be a dangerous combination. Crash severity has increased, so if you're driving, be sure to slow down and look for people. There's no need to speed. If you're biking, ride with traffic. If you're walking, avoid stepping into the road if possible. If you have to walk in the street, walk facing traffic. Learn more at walkbikedrivesafe.org. Times get dark. We can't see the help that's all around us. When you don't know where to turn, let 211 be your guiding light. Two one one, how can I help you? Our guides are ready to connect you with the help you need. other reasons.
resources. Call 211 or visit 211.org. 211. Get connected. Get help. Welcome back to the Megacast. I'm Tyler Keeft. Uh, you can learn more information about our show and everywhere we broadcast live and live to tape. Find all of our interviews and our full episodes on demand by visiting our website at civiccentertv.com slash megacast. Joining us now is Dave Dulio. He is a professor of political science and the director of the Center for Civic Engagement at Oakland University. Dave, thank you for being with us again. Hey, it's my pleasure, Tyler. Nice to see you. Nice to see you as well. So, um, uh, real, uh, uh, we should just immediately go into the unfortunate incident that happened uh, on Tuesday, November 30th at Oxford High School, uh, where f uh, four kids and seven additional people, uh, four kids killed and seven additional people injured in a school shooting uh, right here in Oakland County at Oxford High School. Um, and so once again, here we are sprung into the debate in the aftermath as we see so often uh, with these school shootings around the U.S., uh, whenever this happens, the immediate discussion turns into a debate over what can we do to stop this? How can we how can we prevent another one from happening? And it, it, it becomes a two-pronged debate, at least initially. Uh, on one end, it's a, a mental health debate. It's a mental health. Pro it's considered a mental health problem. On the other end, it's considered a a gun safety and a, a gun control problem, and that often leads to political vitriol and, and really, as, as I called it yesterday, a shouting match begins. Problem solving doesn't begin. It's, the, it's a shouting process. For you, as the director of civic engagement uh, at Oakland, of, of the Center for Civic Engagement at Oakland University, as you have discussions on these kinds of hot button issues and important issues, um, and important topics that all often are very complicated problems that require creative and sensitive problem-solving efforts. Where should we be beginning these conversations on, whether it be the gun issue, the mental health issue, the overall issues that go into the occurrence of these school shootings? That, I know, being a broad question, but at, at the very least to begin a productive conversation, as opposed to a shouting match that ultimately leads nowhere and ends up snuffing out the conversation altogether. Yeah, I think that's a really good point, Tyler. The the, I, I, in my view, one of the reasons that we maybe seem to make very little progress on maybe this or uh, any host of issues, frankly, is that <clears throat> too quickly it does devolve into a shouting match, and I think that that happens at least to some degree because uh, the different sides, people that disagree, don't come to the conversation with any respect for the other, right? And it, it, they're, they're seen immediately as political opponents. They're seen immediately as, um, you know, somebody's trying to infringe on this or somebody's not do enough, doing enough on that. And in my view, when you start from that kind of rancorous, uh, contentious position, um, you can't get anywhere. We're joined by Dave Dulio, the director of the Center for Civic Engagement at Oakland University and professor of political science, uh, joining us on the Megacast. And um, uh, I said it yesterday, it, it's an issue, the school shooting issue and the sh school shooting debate, it's an issue that it doesn't really hit home until it hits home. And with yeah. this being so local to us in Oakland County in particular, but uh, even on a broader scale across the state of Michigan with this affecting um, people of all ages and in all sectors of our state, uh, the debate begins immediately. And often that debate on, on the political spectrum is obstructed, particularly on the gun issue because of affiliations with different organizations, particularly uh, with the NRA for uh, m more so for the Republicans uh, than the Democrats. So the power of the NRA and gun owners make it impossible or at least, or, or Better yet, why does that affiliation seem to make it so tough to even begin any sort of substantial debate on the political side, on the policy-making side, related to gun laws federally and even statewide? Well, I'm not so sure it's the power of the NRA as it is the elected officials that are, that are in office, right? The NRA isn't making any decisions. The NRA isn't... Um, uh, stopping any 
proposed law from making headway, right? It's the it's elected officials that are that are doing that, and and I think that you know it, it's no secret, right? We have a, a Republican majority in both chambers of the legislature, and um, you know the Republicans tend to not be terribly supportive of of increased gun control measures, um, and that's because that's for a number of reasons right and and you'd have to talk to an individual legislator to 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 know exactly what that individual is thinking but i can think of at least two off the top of my head and 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 that is one that that they don't agree with it personally right they don't think that increased gun control legislation is necessary or good or or however they want to put it uh, and the other one is they're reflecting their constituents, right? We have a, a lot of places in the in the state of Michigan and across the country, um, very rural in nature, uh, where firearms are used for multiple purposes, and um, and those folks don't want to see any uh, any rolling back of of the the rights and liberties that they say they enjoy. We're joined by Dave Duldale. He's a professor of political science and the director of the Center for Civic Engagement at Oakland University. And and often in that debate that that we're speaking on uh, and and related to gun issues, uh, it it dates back to um, protection of Second Amendment rights. And um, the Second Amendment quite uh, explicitly uh, states, quote, uh, then you have the right to, quote, a well-regulated militia being necessary to the security of a free state. The right of people to keep and bear arms shall not be infringed. Uh, back in 1791, when, when that was written uh, when and the Bill of Rights was ratified, what did that mean now, uh, mean then, and, and what interpretation is generally being so protected in today's world, being that our gun situation today is significantly different, significantly more powerful, and much more broadly utilized by Americans than it was back when it was ratified way back in 1791 or even in the early days of this country. Sure, well, I think the the answer to your question lies in in some recent Supreme Court decisions, and that is that um, that it extends beyond a, uh, a militia, right? It is a personal, an individual right to keep and bear arms, right? I mean, and that's that's where the court is right now. That's where, and that's where the law is right now. We're joined by Dave Dulio, professor of political science and director of the Center for Civic Engagement at Oakland University, joining us today on the MegaCast uh, across the board here in Michigan and federally. There are a number of other uh, uh, pol- uh, number of other. Uh, political issues that are on the forefront and other political topics that are going to be on the forefront in 2022, including here in Michigan, our gubernatorial election coming up next year. Uh, since we last spoke, Kevin Rinke, a business owner of uh, Rinke Automotive Group, announced that he's running uh, as a Republican for uh, for governor for Michigan's next next governor. He was a Trump supporter uh, as well for, for greater context of uh, where he stands within the Republican Party. What are his chances here in the state of, uh, of Michigan, or, or with, at least within the Republican Party of obtaining the nomination from the party and then competing with Governor Whitmer? Well, let's start with the primary first, because anybody that's going to challenge the governor has got to get through that, right? And, and in in August of 22, uh, we will have a primary election and Republicans and, and well, it, not just Republicans, anybody who wants to vote in the Republican primary for governor can here in Michigan because of our open primary system. But uh, I think it's wide open. Um, Mr. Rinke has uh, some advantages. I think um, you know, the, the, on the funding side is is the uh, biggest one of those, at least that that is out there before us at the moment. I think it's interesting to consider uh, former Chief James Craig's campaign. Uh, it's been pretty quiet uh, in the last several months. It, the the biggest news being that. He split with one of his uh, uh, major advisors from the campaign. Um, it, but quiet is what I would describe the Craig campaign at the moment. I think uh, Mr. Rinky, as I said, has got some uh, funding advantages, and that could really help carry him forward uh, through the primary season, depending in part on what his uh, his opponents do. And Chief Craig is only one of them. There, there are uh, a handful of others that are likely to make it a very interesting Republican primary. I think in the general, 
it really does depend uh, who comes out of that Republican primary. Uh, it, 2022 is shaping up to be a bad year for Democrats. And, and I say that uh, because of a, a couple of factors. One, the, the current political dynamics, right? The, um, the, the president is uh, seeing his approval ratings sink. We've got inflation that is the highest in decades. We've got other issues that we're facing as a nation and a state. Uh, but I also say it because that's what history tells us. History tells us that uh, the party of the president does poorly in midterm elections, which 2022 is, right? It comes at the midpoint of a president's term in office. And the reason for that, generally speaking, is that the, the president has uh, been in office for a couple of years and the the country maybe has soured on the president's performance the country is disappointed that the president maybe hasn't followed through with some campaign promises and you can see that that coming up boiling up as well right and uh how often did we hear joe biden say he was going to shut down the virus and i mean maybe that was a mistake for him to say that because there's you know what can what can one person do what can the what can one government do to shut down a virus and we're seeing maybe that come back to haunt him so anyway for for whatever reason right the public is down on the president but the president's not on the ballot in midterms so where does the public turn to take out their frustration well they turn to the to the uh, candidates of the president's party and in it for example in only two elections back to the uh years of fdr uh in only two elections has the party of the president gained seats in the U.S. House of Representatives. Only twice in that period, right? In, ev in every other instance, they have lost seats. And sometimes they've lost huge numbers of seats. Uh, and, and I think in Michigan, we see that trickle down to the state level. And I say that because since 1976, only one time has the candidate of the president's party been elected governor. So that would tell us that Gretchen Whitmer is in for some, uh, you know, for, for a tough campaign and, and maybe even to lose. However, and here's the interesting thing about Michigan politics, in that same time period, only one time has a sitting governor been denied reelection. So we have these two forces that are uh, working against each other. And in, in November of 2022, we'll see, have to see which, which of those forces wins out. We're joined by Dave Dulio, a political science professor and director of the Center for Civic Engagement at Oakland University. Dave, another minute with you before we'll say goodbye. I want to give you an opportunity to tell us about any uh, upcoming events or discussions at the Center for Civic Engagement. Sure. Well, uh, thanks as always for the opportunity, Tyler. I, in uh, the new year, look for the Center to continue our office hours series where we highlight faculty experts at Oakland University. We, we have a number of uh, those lined up for uh, for the community and for campus uh, on topics like politics, on topics like redistricting, the 2022 election cycle, uh, the, the governor's race. We're also going to do one on uh, inflation, the supply chain, uh, and other um, economic issues that will and could affect uh, the, the election cycle. And uh, we've got some other things that are in the hopper and not ready to talk about those yet because the plans aren't finalized, but uh, we'll have plenty uh, for uh, those who are interested to uh, check us out in the new year. Well, Dave, we appreciate your time. Thank you for joining us, uh, clarifying uh, some of these issues that we're discussing here in the state of Michigan and looking forward to 2022 and what will be a very interesting year politically here in the state of Michigan. That's for sure. Thanks, Tyler. Appreciate it. Big thank you to Dave and to all of our guests uh, on today's edition of the Megacast uh, before him, including Filthy Rockwell, a music producer and the founder of Filthy Cares, uh, a charity and nonprofit, Rick Bloom from Bloom uh, Advisors, J.J. Conway from the J.J. Conway Law Firm, and Rich Pullman, a warning coordination meteorologist with the National Weather Service of Detroit and Pontiac. You can find all of our interviews and our full episodes on demand on our website at civics 
on our TV.com slash megacast, as well as links to every single one of our partnering community television and radio stations, as well as our online outlets, including My Michigan TV. Head over to our coronavirus link as well to keep up to date on all the latest information about COVID-19, the variants, the vaccines, precautionary measures you can take, and more from the CDC, the MDHHS, and the Oakland County Health Division, as well as stay up to date on the latest news, both on the COVID front and beyond from many of our local news outlets here in southeastern Michigan and all across the Great Lakes State. That is going to do it for today's edition of the show. I want to give a big thank you to all of you for tuning in, as well as to our crew, Calvin Brown, our studio producer and our board operator, Larry Nyland, our booking producer, and Jared Clark, our Zoom producer as well. On Civic Center TV, more original programming is coming up next and over on My Michigan TV. It'll be Steve Lato live. We'll be back tomorrow morning at 10 a.m.